eyes again now. Permit me to also welcome Professor Nzata, the former Dean of Health Sciences and Technology. We welcome you. Our recognitions will continue, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and with the permission of the Chairman and the Vice Chancellor of our great university. My name is Professor Frank Collins Sokafo. I'm the university orator. Thank you. Please may we rise for the university anthem. Thank you. While standing, may we invite Professor Father P.S.C. Obiefuna to lead us in the opening prayer. Father, please. Uh, this is our members. Before I say the opening prayer, I, I want to make two points. One, I was to be the first radiologist in Nigeria. When that came in the uh, first time, in the 70s, and my brother bought the phone for me, unfortunately, um, the result did not come back. Two, I want to thank God for a name mentioned here, Professor Mbo. Um, the films of um, the tests I've had in his um, office will be enough for the ceiling of this place three times, searching for what is happening. Well, one of um, his staff said, my friend, go home and carry your cross. And I'm still carrying my cross. It's still with me. We thank God for everything. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for bringing us together here today to listen to yet another inaugural lecture. We thank you for the life given to our brother. We thank you that Professor Z is alive today to present this inaugural lecture. We thank you because of your love. We thank you because of your care. I pray you, Almighty God and Father, as I hand him over to you to take perfect control. Take perfect control of this environment. Send your holy angels to be on guard. Help him to maintain the stability, emotional and intellectual, that he needs to present this inaugural lecture. Thank you for the message that you put across to us. Thank you for the gift of our versus law, ensuring that we have this inaugural lectures. We ask you, God Almighty, even as you bless all who are here and all who are on their way, may the day be a day that will give you honor, praise, and adoration. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much.
Mr. Chairman, sir, and the sister, thank you, Vice Chancellor of Namda Zikiwe University, Oka, here present. Distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to respectfully invite the 94th inaugural lecturer of Namda Azikiwe University, Oka, Professor Kenneth Chukwode Eze, and his beautiful wife, Mrs. Ijoma Charity Eze, to please kindly come up and take your seat. Please, round of applause for them. Kusiel Nehaki cannot draw fellet. Today is their day in a special way. Permit me also to recognize uh, Professor Alex Zundo, former dean, uh, Dr. Jidor Fugu, and uh, Dr. Eric Kume, as well as Dr. Mike Aron, head of radiology, and of course my own dear Professor UC Nogugu, director of international linkages we welcome you we welcome you so without wasting much of our time distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen may i respectfully invite the sixth subtenty vice chancellor of namda zikiwe university oka and to the glory of god the chairman of today's inaugural lecture he is Professor Charles Okechuku Esmone, fellow Academy of Science, to please come up to declare this program open after delivering his opening remarks. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Thank you very much. I want to respectfully recognize the Chairman Inaugural Lecture Committee. I thank you for putting this together at uh, the pace you have been doing this and together with your committee. I appreciate you sincerely. I want to thank the doyins of medicine who are here. i um, seeing them uh, directly. Yes, Professor Umbono, Aine Kenegi, Emeritus Professor. You have been recognized, Mother. We won't stop recognizing you. And I thank you for the wonderful seeds that you sow that uh, the faculty is reaping today. Eben uh, Nenkem, Professor Brian Adema. Yes, Muta, Nandene. I thank you also. You are very much welcome. I thank my brother, my parish priest, uh, Reverend Father Professor B.S.C. Obiefuna, and Mekinegi Nuzo Puriche. And for the testimony you gave us about uh, Professor Mo, and I'll be hearing that name. Uh, okay, everybody that goes to Hamzak, I saw him for the first time physically today. <laughs> you know, I was expecting to see a, a giant. <laughs> Sorry, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> When they mention Hamza Clinic, I go back and was humble. So it's not one very big man, but he's big in action anyway. So I thank you, Prof, for being here physically. Uh, no, Rinde. Uh, I want to respectfully recognize uh, Professor Eunoyalu, um, thanks for being here also. Thank you so much. And the Dean of Arts, Dalurinde, Emeritus Professor uh, Samo May. I thank you for also being here, uh, former DVC. The DVC that I shared office with. Uh, <laughs> and I was admiring the office. And uh, somehow the team, mom, thank you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thank Professor Obuagu, yes, uh, former provost of Federal College of Education, Tinkalo uh, Munze. And the, the director of Tedfon, of the director of Tedfon, yeah, I thank yes, yes, Professor Yenokwe. They didn't recognize you didn't recognize Yenokwe. No, no, 
No, I can't go. I can't go third fall. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. The Director Center for Sustainable Development, I, I recognize you. Yes, in your own right, Professor Dolly Adema. Uh, thank you. And uh, Professor Collins Wogu, Director of our International Collaboration and Linkages. I welcome you again. The immediate past dean of Faculty of uh, Agriculture, yes, Professor Nkiru Melodu, Darurine, and the middle past dean also, Faculty of Health Sciences, and now the director of uh, Center for Radiography and Dosimetric Research, Afona Torogo. But I welcome you again. <laughs> Thank you again. I want to welcome in a special way all the uh, friends of the inaugural lecturer who are here from different parts. I am a much afono nene man, I am a no no to Namdazikiwe University. And above all, the wonderful colleagues of the Faculty of Medicine, Ono Juni, Kem Nikem, or the heads of departments, former directors and the sub-dean and all of you from Faculty of Medicine. And indeed, staff of our great university, Namdazikiwe University, and those from the, uh, from the town who have also come to listen to this uh, great uh, uh, academic icon. I want to tell you all welcome to Namdi Azikiwe University. No, no. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Please, the guru for today's lecture, who is uh, Professor Kenneth Chuku Dieze and the beautiful wife. Um, Kenneth is, uh, is a very simple person, but complex so, so, sometimes. Those who know Ken know he's a very simple but complex person, and I know him personally, so I can speak to that extent. And that is why today he will be describing something that is very simple, some, something that is very complex, but he will present it in a very simple way because I saw the topic. You know, radiology as a whole is one area where people are very uncomfortable discussing. You know, when you stage, and I get married, log in. You want to browse the home It's not something of joy, but I believe that because he knows how to compress very complex things and make them simple, the gown and the town will marry today. We'll, we'll get to understand. As a matter of fact, inaugural lectures are actually deemed to bring out this particular aspect. All over, when people become professors and they profess, those who are outside, they don't know why you are a professor. But by this public declaration, you know, you are, we're inaugurating you into that chair, one way or the other. And you are telling the gown, you are telling the town now, and also the gown, you know, which represent those of us in academia, what you have been doing that uh, has uh, made us to see reason to pronounce you a professor. Professor Adrizi, it's not easy anywhere in the world to become a professor. So we want to hear today from this erudite professor and what he has been doing and that made Namdi Azikiwe University to so honor him, to so grant him this elevated position. Uh, Collins said yesterday that he told the military people harassing him, that I am a, as a professor, I'm a general. So this is the general we're unveiling today. And this general has to tell us what he has done. And I, I want to assure us that it's going to be a very wonderful time we're going to spend uh, listening to him and uh, conventionally want to listen. We're not going to ask him any question. I get away hook line and sinker. I know G Bocha. We accept it because he's a professor of that area. So, and uh, I want to thank him and, uh, and the wife and also thank again the committee of our people who are watching from social media. I get a lot of reports, you know, from you know, uh, on social media about the conduct of our inaugural lecture, the quality of the lectures, and these are the things that have helped us to improve. There are areas where they have also told us we, we did improvement, and I'm sure that they will testify that we took, you know, those uh, comments very positively and have improved significantly. So today again is another opportunity, and I'm thanking them uh, for always being a wonderful audience and for the feedback. Uh, we look forward to a very wonderful 91st inaugural lecture we presented by Professor Kenneth Chuku Deze. So on behalf of the Senate, uh, it's my honor, singular privilege, to declare this 91st inaugural lecture to be presented by Professor Kenneth Chuku Deze. Open. Thank you very much and God bless you.
I think we can do better than that, ladies and gentlemen. So we thank our dear Vice Chancellor for that great speech and of course for declaring the 91st inaugural lecture of our university open. Mr. Chairman, please permit me to recognize Nkechi Eze, the wife of Ugweze Eze. She is here. Very important. Please round of applause for her. Oh, Lolo. And the evangelist Esther Eze, we salute you. We welcome you. Sionunine no. So please, we have a key here, if you are the owner, because the car itself is blocking somebody, you can just come and pick it, so that immediately we start, we are not going to stop again. If you are missing your car key, just come and collect it, because they want to use it for something somewhere. Mr. Chairman, sir, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting into the main program, main reason why we are here, the 91st inaugural lecture, to be delivered by Professor Kenneth Chukwodi Eze. We want to introduce this great scholar, and we want to present him as well. And this is going to take the form of a special presentation to be anchored and handled by no other person than Dr. Eric Ume. Dr. Eric Ume is an associate professor of radiology, faculty of medicine, college of health sciences, Namda Zikiwe University. Okay. The vice chancellor, Namda Zikiwe University. Permit me, sir to stand on existing protocols. It's my honor to stand uh, before this distinguished audience to read the citation of Kenneth Chukwode Eze, MBBS, FWACS, FMCR, and MD, a professor of radiology, a consultant radiologist, a mentor to many, a specialist in radiology education, and a clinical radiologist par excellence. Professor Kenneth C. S. was born 11th March 1967 at Umu Alaoma, Idaho, local government area. Yes. Prof, could you please step forward and send this? Thank you. Yes, so Prof was born on the 11th of March, 1967, at Umu Aloma, North, local government area of Imo State, Nigeria. His secondary education was at Ikari Grammar School, Ikari Akoko, Ondo State, and Government Science Secondary School, Abaji, in the Federal Capital Territory. He bagged his GCE WASC, 1985, and he was the best graduating student at GCO level. He proceeded to the University of Benin to study medicine and backed his MBBS in 1992. Postgraduate as residency training in radiology, which he chose, was uh, at University of Benin Teaching Hospital. And by 2003, he had backed his fellowship of the West African College of Surgeons and Fellowship of Medical College of Radiology, that's awarded by the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, both of them the same year, 2003. He proceeded to the Institute of Diagnostic and Interventional Radiology, Zurich, Switzerland, and backed their fellowship in that course. His Doctorate of Medicine, 2020, um, awarded by the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. 
Prof. Seze has, over the years, attended several management and leadership courses. In fact, between 2006 till date, some of those courses were arranged at this and hosted at this institution. Others by the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, the Ambrus Ali University, Ekboma, Edo State, Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital, Irua, Edo State. He did his housemanship in 1993-94 at Central Hospital, Benin City, Edo State. And then his national youth service at, uh, at the medical center in Federal Polytechnic, Oshun State, 1994 to 95. Professor Eze received the state award in 1995, Best Youth Copper, Oshun State. He was appointed consultant radiologist in 2004 at um, Ira Specialist Teaching Hospital, Edo State. That same year, he was appointed lecturer one at the Department of Radiology, Faculty of Clinical Sciences, College of Medicine, and Bruce Ali University, Ekboma, Edo State, Nigeria. So he was appointed consultant radiologist and lecturer one the same year, 2004. 2008, he was appointed senior lecturer at um, Ambrose Ali University, but that's the same year that he crossed over to Nnamdi Azikiwe University. So he came to us as a senior lecturer, 2008, and naturally was appointed a consultant radiologist at Nnamdi Azikiwe University Teaching Hospital, Newe. He was appointed a reader at the university, 2011, and uh, 2014 was appointed a full professor. Professor Eze has 51 articles published in reputable international and local journals. He has also authored and co-authored some medical radiology books. He has 27 papers at least presented at scientific uh, conferences over the years. He has completed 22, you know, successfully supervised part two dissertations. That's the dissertation that we take to be admitted into our fellowships. He served as head, Department of Radiology, Faculty of Clinical Sciences, and Busali University, um, Ekoma, in 2006-2007. And he then served as head, Department of Radiology, Faculty of Medicine, Namdiaziko University. That's 2014-2017. Then he was the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, 2019, one tenure. Professor Eze has um, continued to lend himself, you know, very much to the affairs of the postgraduate um, colleges, the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria and West African College of Surgeons. He serves in the accreditation panels, he serves as an external examiner in the part one and part two examinations. He often does serve as a member faculty of radiology board for one or both colleges at one time or the other. He's often a resource person and sometimes a course coordinator at the organized update courses for resident doctors. He has served as secretary college committee on the mentoring program organized by the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. He served as a member college committee on drafting of a diploma program in clinical ultrasonography, again, by the National Postgraduate Medical College of uh, Nigeria. You know, other contributions. He served as editor-in-chief, the resident doctor. That's an academic journal you know, published by Association of Resident Doctors, University of Benin Teaching Hospital and also served, in a similar, served a similar assignment for the Benin Journal of Postgraduate Medicine, also published by the same Association of Resident uh, Doctors. Um, he served as Vice President, Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria, NEWI. Served as Secretary General, Association of Radiologists of West Africa. Professor Eze um, is involved in um, services to internally displaced uh, persons. He's been doing this for years uh, in um, an IDP camp in uh, Benin City. It's an IDP camp for internally displaced people from Meduguri. He's been on this every uh, 2017 till date. He has been uh, part of a team providing voluntary free medical services to prison inmates 
working with the Catholic Church. They call it the Prison Doctors Outreach. They were they did this over a 15-year period, 1993 to 2008. Membership of learned societies and organizations. Professor is a member of the Radiological Society of North America, Chicago. He's been that since 2002. Member of the International Congress of Radiology, USA, 2002 till date. Member Nigerian Medical Association. Member Medical and Dental Consultants Association of Nigeria. And member Association of Radiologists of West Africa. His hobbies include mentoring. Professor is a mentor. There's a list of some 66 people or so, if I counted right, who will refer to him as their mentor. He may have mentored them as undergraduates, as fresh doctors, or as PG students. The Department of Radiology at Nnamdi Azikiwe University Teaching Hospital, you know, does receive a lot of uh, visitors from surrounding institutions. You know, people want to come and have their their part two dissertation supervised in our department, actually by him. Or people want to confer with him on research they are doing at their establishments. I'm sure some of his um, proteges are, are here. He also enjoys swimming and traveling. Professor is happily married with children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, another round of applause for him. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, sir, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, may I respectfully invite the 91st inaugural lecturer of Namda Azikiwe University, Oka Professor Kenneth Eze, to formally present his lecture. Round of applause for him, please. Thank you, the University Orator. Thank you, Dr. Eric Ume. Mr. VC, sir. I'm very happy to be here. May I start my lecture? The title of my lecture is Radiology in Nigeria, High-Tech Medicine in Technology Challenge, Low Resource Setting. The Vice Chancellor, sir, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Admin and Academics, the Principal Officers of the University, the Provost College of Medicine, the Deans of Faculties, and other of faculty of medicine and other faculties, distinguished professors, directors and head of departments present, distinguished personalities that are present here, visiting academics, friends and families, friends and family members, Great UNISIC students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here for this inaugural lecture. The first time I was, the, first, the day I was given the date for my inaugural lecture by Professor Richard Owakwe was when Professor Zota presented his inaugural lecture. That was 20, 27th of April, 2023. After the lecture, we were going back to Newi and I was picked up by kidnappers. So, and uh, 
all that transpired. When I came out of that one, I was warned by police to sell that particular car. I was thinking it's something of one month or two or this. Exactly three weeks from that date, I was coming with that car from Asaba and I had a terrible accident and I nearly died. So this inaugural lecture is very symbolic to me because I, I thank God that I'm alive to present it. And I'm happy, Owakwe, Professor Owakwe asked me if I postpone it, I will go and join the queue. And I said to wait for another five years. So I decided to um, talk it up. My name is Kenneth Eze, Kenneth Chukudi Eze. I was, I grew up to know that I had two mothers and I didn't know which one is bigger than the other. And uh, I know I used to wonder how come that I have two mothers, but it was later I got to know that the one we called Man Kuku was actually my aunt. And the one we called Man Kenta, who I normally look down, because Man Kuku used to boss it over her, was actually my biological mother. Okay. So, um, I had all the love I could get in this world growing up. That's the summary of that. So, why did I enter into radiology? When we were medical students, it used to be that any time there is a difficult case in any of the departments, surgery, medicine, pediatrics, the doctors we gather, it's okay, let's go and see what the radiologists will say. And all of us will walk behind them and we go to the radiology department and they will put the x-ray or whatever and then everybody will be discussing academics. And after that, every will come back, it's as if the road is clear. That was what we had. Radiology was academics, every time checking the book and all that. I said, ah, these people that other doctors are consulting, who are they? That was why I entered radiology. Because radiologists, we saw them as consultants. Why the patient consult the other doctors? The other doctors go to consult the radiologists. <laughs> Thank you very much. So what is radiology? What is radiology? In before um, 90, 1895, there was no thing called radiology. There was a man called uh, Wilhelm Rongin. He was investigating cathode ray tube. Cathode ray tube. They were their main. What they were actually looking was how to convert iron to gold. That was they were using all sorts of rays, thinking that it will cause radioactivity and to con convert iron to gold. There was a lot of experiment that time using all type of rays. But one Friday, when his colleagues in the lab didn't come, so he was investigating. Somehow, he placed his hand somewhere, and he was able to see the bones of his hand. He used uh, paper and place, and they could not stop it. He said, I, there is not, this thing must be new. And uh, he took that weekend to do a lot of experiments and uh, discovered that that was a new type of ray. He now published it, which he called X-ray. He said a new type of ray. He showed the image of his wife's hand, finger, which he took, and it was like a boom. So from that date, within less than one year, you had almost 1,000 X-ray uh, machines in Europe and America and 1,000 publications. Ronjin won the first Nobel Prize. So it, before that time, how was doctors able to see the inside of the body? If somebody had what we call acute abdomen, you have to open up and see what is the problem. If it's not something you can have, uh, close, uh, do that day, you close it up and go and plan. So there was no means of seeing the inside of the body what is happening, but X-ray gave that first glimpse of sin inside the body. 
what I, what we are saying that there is a type of ray, just like light ray, this type of light you are seeing, but a different type that is transparent to the human body, to the flesh. So only the bones could sort of shed it. That is a simple explanation of an X-ray. So that was how it was discovered. Now, let me just go to the studies we did in Erwa. Immediately I left my residency in Benin to Erwa, I was confronted with Lassa fever. Lassa fever, you, we come to the hospital, you see patients, those, somebody is discussing with you and it turns like this and it's gone. All of us were afraid, nurses, doctors, everybody. So that was how we started the investigation of Lassa fever. Everybody, every doctor was afraid. So we said, if we keep on being afraid, we are not going to solve this problem. So we started some of the investigations of Lassa fever using the x-rays we could have. That time, they don't allow us to do x-ray on Lassa fever because they believe that you are taking the x-ray to, you are taking the patient to an enclosed place and that is going to affect everybody. But we convinced the hospital to move the x-ray to a more open place where we could assess them. That was the first investigation we did on Lassa fever. Then the, some of the studies that had confirmation, we couldn't confirm Lassa fever. We, the sample had to be taken to Germany and confirmed. So they brought it and that was the first time we say 100% this is Lassa fever by the aid of German team. From that confirmation, we were able to find that a lot of people were inf involved in the area, in the university, in the, in the hospital. That's what we call nosocomia infection. So we put that in simple statistics and uh, what we, we had 6.5% of people having Lassa fever and this Lassa fever was proven by re re reverse transcript Test polymerase chain reaction. That's what we call PCR. It's almost like a complete confirmatory test. So, in all that, we had very large number of uh, staff, almost 33% of the hospital staff tested positive for acute infection. When we extrapolated it to the total number of students in Ekoma University. We had that a lot of students were affected by what we call subclinical infection. That somebody is sick and you don't know that he's sick, but he goes to an area and give it to other people. And from that, that our studies were able to in, invite a lot of people from um, Europe and America international team that are now presently in Eroa treating Lassa fever. We did some radiology on Lassa fever and what and the most significant things we found was that many people with Lassa fever present with what we call acute abdomen. That somebody is complaining of abdominal pain. And if he's a woman, you can think that he's related to childbirth, but he has Lassa fever. Then some people are complaining of chest a chest pain, you think is pneumonia, but there are a type of Lassa fever that does not even allow the person to breathe. When we did X-ray, the type of thing we see in the X-ray was never seen before. We call it acute respiratory distress syndrome. That disease, that a type of appearance that is almost leading to death. Um, and then we found that many of the patients did not survive. So we have image here what we look like cholecystitis, cholecystitis inflammation of gallbladder, which the surgeons may operate thinking that it is that inflammation, but it was actually bleeding from by the Lassa fever into the wall of the gallbladder. We study meningitis and error. Meningitis is type of infection in the brain and what we found out was that most of the patients that had meningitis were they had infection that could easily be treated 
But because they go to areas, they go to places that could not treat infection very well. Some went to patent medicine stores. Some went to traditional healers. Some went to even some general duty doctors that will not I give them the high quality, high quantity of drug or medicine or antibodies that they require to treat that infection. So it goes for a long time and they come down with meningitis. So, and from that study, we were able to do some community sensitization on what patients, if they have, they should go straight to a uh, tertiary hospital instead of waiting at other places that we make the infection to go in a more serious uh, form. In the whole, the most important complication we saw in complicated meningitis was accumulation of fluid in the brain, what we call hydrocephalus. And it is a very difficult to, a very difficult disease to treat, most of them by uh, the neurosurgeon to drain it. I think there have been a lot of patients of Dr. Professor Emejulu. Yes, that's a picture of uh, hydrocephalus in patients with meningitis. We also did ultrasound in patients to find out what are the things that we find in most of the patients. And we found that almost majority of them were still meningitis apart from those that had uh, congenital anomaly. So meningitis is a very big infection in children, particularly very young children. And because the Doctors that are not in tertiary institutions may not easily recognize it because they come in very different subtle forms. We also did computer tomography in patients with meningitis. And it is almost the same finding that we have in ultrasound. Meningitis complications, hydrocephalus bleeding into the brain from infection. We study patients with HIV AIDS. We study the brains of patients with HIV AIDS using computed tomography. Most of the patients with HIV AIDS, they come in a very late form because of denial. They first of all deny they are not sick until either they go to coma or they, have, they start having convulsion or when it is obvious to the person that is almost about to die. And by that time, when we do computer tomography, we want to look at what is happening in the brain that is making the person to have many symptoms that we know that are arising from the brain. And what we found was a type of infection that is not common in normal people, what we call toxoplasmosis. In normal person, we have immunity that can be able to withstand that toxoplasmosis. But when people have HIV AIDS, it reduces their immunity and that toxoplasmosis become very much. So that was what we found in people with tuberculosis. We also have tuberculosis of the brain, which are not common in normal people because our immunity is able to suppress it. Sometimes we have people with um, bleeding into the brain, young people that are not supposed to have such so those are the images we have. The number C is what we call brain infarction. You can see dark area there. Those dark areas are places that they are bleeding. Yes, that, that's area that have already, a, a part of the brain that have already died because the blood, either they are bleeding there, and that place has uh, liquefied, that's formed like a type of fluid, or that there is blockage of blood to flow to that place. Then this one with round area, uh, that one is a uh, tosoplasmosis in patient with AIDS. So, and the, the, this study was done in around between 1999 and 2002. There was no form of uh, national health insurance. So, patients have to wait the cost of HIV was very expensive, and we had to start making noise with this type, with uh, all these studies, and on the importance of early treatment 
and the institution of natural health insurance that can take care of some of these people. And we thank God that around 2004, the issue of national health insurance came to be. And presently, we don't see most of these very bad cases in patients with HIV AIDS. We study tuberculosis in rural areas in Erua. We did x-ray, we did put in test x-ray, and we checked both of them. We want to know which one normally have, which, if a patient does not have enough money and don't have money to do sputum tests and don't have enough money to do chest x-ray, which singular one can we do to be able to diagnose tuberculosis? And we found out that more people had sputum positive than show in x-ray. And the reason is that there's a lot of ribs covering part of the chest. The heart is covering part of the chest. The diaphragm is covering part of the chest. And if you have tuberculosis in these areas, the radiologists may not be able to see it. So we advise that if there's one singular test you must do, do sputum uh, study instead of chest x-ray. We studied, we said patient with malaria, we wanted to know what are the things we can find in patients in malaria with radiological study. We studied their chest and what we are able to find, we find things like pneumonia, the patient will just present with pneumonia, but if you are treating that patient, it is not pneumonia, it is malaria. Some of them have what we call plural uh, collection, which is fluid in the plural space, or what we call fluid in the chest, in layman's time. Then inside their, inside their spleen, there are some lesions in the spleen, especially in children, and then some of them go to have cerebral malaria, which look like meningitis. So, and all these patients, apart from the malaria that are isolated in their blood, there are no other type of infection. So, we concluded that malaria is not just a simple infection. Malaria is a very complicated infection and it continues to be the commonest killer in our environment. Because it manifests in different forms, doctors who are not very active or very careful or don't have very high index of, of suspicion may not easily recognize that it is malaria. So while you are treating patient, always check for malaria because it can be the cause of that lesion you are seeing in the brain. We also study amoebic liver abscesses and we found that they are easily treated. Phonias gangrene is a type of infection that occurs in scrotum of a man and it will just destroy the scrotum and the balls will just come out. Very difficult to treat by the surgeons and by the urologists. Oh, um, bonus, sir. Respect. Yes. So, is a, we studied that uh, infection and the, the, we, what, uh, we found out what we call perianacesis was the commonest cause, followed by diabetes. There are a lot of lesions that cause it and it's a very depleting infection. You find most, most patients that have it, they hide it because it's occurring in a place that, and they, imagine when the scrotum is removed, you have the ball. If it's in a rural environment, they may say it is an act of God, in quote. So it's a very, it has a stigma. Uh, so, and then we're able to treat those patients, some cancel them on those that are predisposing factor this, so that it can be ameliorated in our environment. And we published that study in International Journal. There's a, a disease we call Amelifa amelatus, which normally cause Africans a lot of stress abroad when it's diagnosed. It is caused by what we call tongueworm. And that tongueworm is found in snake. So if you have that amylifa amylatus, which is like calcified lava of that tongueworm, that means you're a snake eater. So it's common in the environment, and you sometimes you see very wealthy man goes abroad and they do chest x-ray or do other investigation, and you find that amylifa amylatus. And then the person is stigmatized. So that is... Uh, 
is among our environment, we have seen a lot of it at, uh, at Newe, but it's also common in some part of uh, West, Western Nigeria, more than this side. We did some studies on COVID infection, majorly bordering on preparedness of radiology department to handle COVID infection when the COVID is, was very thick. And what we found out many times when you when there are patient with COVID infection and you admit the patient and it's come to come to the radiology department, you see some people dodging work, or some people taking excuse, or or even uh, staff uh, going to take sick leave so that they will not be in the hospital when that patient will be brought to the department. Then another thing is that many of the hospitals did not have what we call protective clothing, PPPE. That's those dresses that you can wear while you are investigating the patient. And it was a cause of stress to the doctors. The recommendation we gave it to the government and it led to improvement in the provision of the personal protective equipment. We study radiation protection, radiation protection in our environment. We use X-ray, um, unfortunately, X-ray has effect on DNA. So while we are using X-ray, we want to make sure that we don't have uh, the one that unwanted effect on the patient. And then when we did the study, in normal radiology department, there are factors we put in place to make sure that the quantity of X-ray we use in patient is adequate and unharmful to that patient. Some of them is that the, the quality and the amount of X-ray we use, we want to make sure that it's no more than what is needed. We want to make sure that we, there's no repeat. If you do chest X-ray, it should be once. You should not be repeating it because you are not getting it and then you'll be irradiating patient unnecessary. We want to make sure that the patient, the patient don't bring their children. You don't bring junior ones. If we are doing this, if we book you, we don't want you to come with a lot of people, especially people that are not mobile. You see people, some with stick, a cane stick, an old man is escorting the, the wife to an X-ray department. When you now tell the old man that, please go out, it will take almost two hours to go out, outside the department. So we don't want that. So when we investigated that, we find out that some of the instructions we gave the person that we normally use to reduce radiation protection are not adhered to. There's a machine we have in a Benedion hospital which we call extracorporeal shock, shock wave lithotripsy. We use it to crack stone in the kidney without operating. But sometimes we use x-ray to either investigate the person or even to crack that. So in the process, you may even give more x-ray than what is required. So we went to Ibnedio Hospital when that machine was operational. I wanted to see how much of protection do these people have while treating their renal stone. Do they expose them or do they uh, protect them? What we found out that while that machine lasted, the hospital was interested in treating the renal stone. They did not care about other causes of what we were using to treat that patient. And we published it in journals. And um, although that machine is not functioning and nobody has that particular machine now, but we hope that when such a machine comes, we're not going to have that type of repeat again.
Kung Ana among the Europe of America who eat high protein diet. So we don't eat high protein diet. So we don't have a lot of uh, kidney stones. So while you buy machine, big machine, the number of people using that machine is very low. The prevalence of the disease was very low. So that was why they tolerated that that machine was in their diet. find out the people that had diabetes mellitus at Edward Ezali Hospital for over four years. They want to know what was causing the effect of diabetes mellitus in them. Now, the children they had that had all these problems, they were not able to eat well. They were not getting the right diet. Um, diabetes mellitus had brought them. What they found out that majority of the people Majority of the people that came to the hospital, 62.2 percent that came to the hospital with diabetes mellitus, came in diabetic ketoacidosis. That they were in coma. So the patient were, you know, when they get in coma, that's when they brought them, and there's when we found out that they had diabetes mellitus. So it is not a very, it's not a good, uh, it's not a good image for any of us. So when we have complaints that are related to high blood sugar, we should go to the hospital, not to go to, because diabetic ketoacidosis is a very difficult disease to manage, especially unless that person is a specialist. Many of us are doctors. If we are not in the internal medicine and you admit diabetic ketoacidosis, we will run away because it is the internal medicine people that can sit down there for almost three days treating only one person. We don't have that training. Other people, other field of medicine don't have that training. So most of our patients go to hospital at a very late stage and very late presentation. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We looked at the patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease at Eroa. He said, what is the occupation that predisposed to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Something like asthma, pulmonary emphysema, that makes somebody not to breathe well. And we found that majority of the people were farmers. They were farmers. Majority of the patients were farmers. And the meaning is that when they are hosting or when they are carrying other farming activity, we are not usually aware that some of those, some of those dust predispose us to disease that can affect the chest. We check the ultrasound of children. We check the thyroid of children in Africa and compare it to that of Europe. And we found out that the size of the thyroid gland in Africa is very comparable, African children is very comparable to that of children in Europe and America. We measured the diameter of the aorta in hypertensive and non-hypertensive. And we find out that those that are hypertensive, who have hypertension, the diameter of the aorta is much increased than normal people. We check patient with trauma. We study patient with trauma, what we call traumatic brain injury, road traffic accident, fall, gunshot injury to the brain. And we wanted to find out what is the thing that we have in their brain. And we have a lot of lesion, but the most, of, the most common one is bleeding into the brain, which is a very serious disease. So most of them that come, they have very serious lesion in the brain. Some of them have skull fractures. Some have cerebral competition, epidural hematoma. These are bleeding in brain between the brain and the skull. And many of them are amenable to surgical treatment. We did a lot of study in patients with an 
traditional bone setter. There is a village in a do state we call Ogwa. The whole of that village, everybody practices traditional bone setting. So we did a community-based study to find out after treatment, how much of these people get well according to we, the doctor's standard? How many of those bones are well? How many of those bones get infection? How many of those are, uh, what are the complications? We interviewed the people, the patient, we interviewed the villager, we interviewed the traditional bone setters. And what we found was intriguing. Number one is that infection was very rare. Most of them, if the patient has open wound, they first refer to hospital to treat the infection after that before they start the traditional bone setting. They had local herbs that were able to treat other minor infections. For those that successfully were successfully treated and discharged, complications were very small. So, and we concluded that before the advent of the Europeans in Africa, we had normal way of treating our patient, and we should not neglect it. So, we, we now went into the literature to find out that, let's say, 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, before the Christianity, we studied the activities of traditional bone setter. Because if you go to literature among the doctors, there are those that there are a school of thought that believe that why the infection is rare because the patient buy antibodies by themselves. Some argue that antibodies are even put in the herbal medicine. So, but we find out that before the advent of antibiotics, the uh, the, among the doctors, in quote, in 4000 BC, the result they were getting at that time is very similar to the result we are getting now. In Egypt, in 4000 BC, that is uh, before the Christian area, we are talking about a time of over 5,000 years. We say most of the injuries that were treated had very effective healing and some even was even better and more favorable than what we consider in today's uh, standard. We checked, we studied patients that had road traffic accident that have ocular trauma, that have trauma to the eyes. We now wanted to find out what happened to their eyes, those that have um, injury to the eyes. And what we found out was that when patient had road traffic accident and has injury to the eye and has other lesions like brain or the abdomen, the doctors don't consider the eye. They first consider the abdomen that can kill the person or consider the brain that can kill the person. So by the time the person is getting well, the nurse says, okay, go and see the ophthalmologist. Apart from teaching hospital that the ophthalmologist is in that place, that can come and investigate or check that eye immediately. Most of the treatment of the eye condition are very late, leading to loss of eye that could easily be salvaged. So, and we advise doctors that immediately a patient has trauma to the brain or to the face that, and the eye is involved, effort should be made to call ophthalmology to investigate that eye at the same time that you are treating that condition. We also did some studies in some checking some herbal medicine, Mojela remedy, and we found out that most of them are effective. We collaborated with some people to study immunity of children in hepatitis, and we found that after immunization, doctors don't go back to check the immunity level of those that are, were immunized. There have been a lot of interest in zinc complexes in forming immunity, especially with COVID and other infections of children and in treating patients with diabetes. 
we review some of them and the conclusion is that zinc complexes have promising effect in treating patients with diabetes. We did a lot of study and we wanted to find a pattern of death among Nigerian leaders. We studied the people that have led Nigeria from independence to 2006 or 2005. Over 75% of those that have led Nigeria were military generals and over 75 of them were northerners. And the three people that died in office at that time are northerners. We now find out why among those Nigerian leaders that died in office, what was the cause? All of them, the 100% of them, occur in period of strife. Ironsi, Tafara Belewa was caused by when there was fracas in the in the election of Western Western Nigeria. Ironsi was caused by the coup and the associated condition of revenge coup. That was a period of strife, and then Motla Muhammad was also called by coup when there was coup by a group of people who felt that and then the uh, uh, Mutala Muhammad was also a type of revenge coup so Mut uh, Abacha Ibrahim Abacha occurred in a period of self succession when he attempted to self succeed so we concluded that Period of strife is the singular most important thing in the causes of death of leaders. We now analyze how can death of leaders be stopped or reduced in Nigeria. We say democratic elections, democratic election, transparent democratic election, and handing over power to elected leader, an attempt not to stay overstay in office are the things that will lead to um, reduction of debt among the Nigerian leaders. We work with dermatologists and we had a lot of patients presenting with pruritus, that's itching while bathing. The person wants to bath and is itching. As simple as it is, it is a very difficult condition to treat because everybody wants to bath. So you see people stay a long time without bathing. So I wanted to find what was the cause of those itching. What, is it the water or what, what was the cause of the itching? And what we found out, most of those itching were related to the temperature of the water. Either the water, some people react to hot water, some people react to cold water, but not normal water. So we advise that for those who itch, they should try to leave their, 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 their water to be normal temperature, room temperature. There's a condition we call acute confusional state. Acute confusional state. And we analyzed the people that had acute confusional state at University of Benin Teaching Hospital. And we found out that some of them were those that were trying to have stroke, what we call stroke involution, stroke in involution. We also found out that some were on steroid therapy, those that are being on steroids. Some are caused by drug intoxication. Somebody is smoking Indian hemp or is taking all that drugs, but he does not want the doctor to know and is coming in a confused state. When we try to analyze the finding in the computer tomography of the people, of these patients with acute confusional state, we find out that many of them have abnormal findings. Most of them because of the stroke in involution. Then there's another, those that had trauma, some people have trauma, especially trauma to the, to the thigh. So trauma to the thigh sometimes it leads to embolism of fat, 
to the brain or to the heart, leading to some type of acute confusional state. We analyze the factor that determine the type of soap people use. Why do people use different type of soap? Yes, soap. Soap. That's important to the dermatologist. And we found that some people prefer medicated soap, some people prefer toilet soap. That's normal soap that is not medicated. We're now trying to find what, why do some people prefer this soup? Some people prefer this soup out of convention. They don't have really any reason, any major reason. Some of them prefer, some they say, they think that medicated soap make them not to have jam. Some people feel that medicated soap are sensitive to their skin. Some people feel that uh, uh, medicated soap does not kill the, uh, uh, does not wash enough. So, and uh, so we said that the use of soap is according to according to preference, different people's preference. We analyze the pattern of uterine and fallopian tube abnormalities in people with hysterosarpingography. Hysterosarpingography is a type of test we use to check the tube of women who want to con con conceive. In the reproductive tract of women, there's a tiny tube that the sperm must journey before it goes to meet the egg. And that tube is so tiny that any small thing can make it to either squeeze or to, to have a type of uh, different shape that can lead to that movement not being straight or sometimes even block. And the, for those that it has blocked, it can be a, a different type of stress to the women. Until recently, when there is IVF, it used to be a very important test. And even now, because IVF has a, very, a major drawback in that sometimes the, the sperm that is used to fertilize the egg may not come from the husband. So, but in normal delivery, at least you can say this is the person that conceived. So, and when we did that analysis, we find different causes of infertility and the different, different lesions in the, tuba, in the tube. The commonest one is tuba blockade. There is what we call hydrosabi. The tube has become so sick that it now swell and accumulates plenty of fluid. The span cannot pass because when they come, it will just drown in that water. So, we now say, we talk about high-tech medicine. High-tech medicine. What is high-tech medicine? The use of technology like X-ray, CT scan that normally uses computer and computer software to make diagnosis. Africa have no way of manufacturing equipment and we are not good in software making. So we are dependent on Europe and America for technology. In our radiology department, we are completely dependent on Europe. Now what is low resource setting? Low resource setting are countries that are not able to meet, that have very low what we call development uh, index low uh, high mortality high maternal mortality high infant mortality and most of those countries are poor countries they are in africa particularly west africa so these countries cannot maintain the equipment we cannot manufacture equipment we depend on europe and technology so we say they are technologically challenged. We don't have money to buy. We don't have resources to produce. We don't have the brain or the organization, organizational manpower to produce it. So we are challenged. 
if you come to our hospital in Newe, you see a lot of machines that are broken down. Sometimes we don't even know what is the problem. And somebody has to be invited from Europe or America to come and diagnose it. So we are technological challenge. We are net consumer of technology. X-ray, we talk when it started in 1985. It came to Nigeria in 1913 for the first time in Lagos and in Calabar in, in 19, 1914. It came to Enugu in 1925. Other days of installation, it came to some part of Africa before I was. We had ultrasound for the first time in 1975 in Ibada and in Enugu in 1983. Abacha, the problem, the issue Abacha had with the world where we have blockade was a, a blessing to medical field because Abacha ordered very expensive equipment with technology to be installed in Nigeria so that he can treat his family and him. That was the beginning of high-tech medicine in Nigeria at a digital age. That was 1995. So we had different hospitals where they are produced, where they were installed Loot, Ibada, UNTH, some private hospital also had, Ignatian Hospital, Ware, Eco Hospitals, St. Nicholas Hospitals. When Obasanjo came, Obasanjo improved on it, and we had better equipment. Good Lord Jonathan and Yeradua, Yeradua and Good Lord Jonathan, he also improved and made sure we had more installation in Nigeria. We had MRI too, and I mentioned of the one that Ibnedio installed, which was iconic as of that time. This is the machine that we have in Nayut, Newe, CT scan and MRI that can see the inside of the body without opening it. So we have the days that different machines were installed in Nigeria. I tried to compare when they were installed in Southeast. On the whole, Southeast, Southeast is low compared to other parts of Nigeria. The number of professionals to man this equipment, we don't have enough. We, don't, we have very few number. The number we are talking 200, 300, 5,000 for a population of over 200 million people. So we don't have enough people. And if you come in the area of biomedical engineering, the area that produces this equipment, Africa, Nigeria is low. We had almost 200 biomedical engineers in Nigeria. That is why we are flat. We have radiotherapy is the same scenario as we have in radiology. Of recent, since 2015, there have been improvement with some hospitals improving. We have Ogara, we have that's Data State Teaching Hospital installed more modern equipment. We have the one at Young uh, Aqua Born State Teaching Hospital, they installed modern equipment. And recently, at University of Medugri Teaching Hospital, this is the CT scan that we have in Nigeria. In the whole, we have almost, um, how do I say, we have almost 300 CT scan in Nigeria. Now, in the city of Cairo, Cairo, city of Cairo have more CT scan than we have in the whole Nigeria. Both the same thing as MRI and other things. So why, what is the challenge of high-tech medicine in Nigeria? We don't have statistics. We don't have how many. We don't, we don't, the, the number that we are talking about of recent, we are trying to get it. If you tell a, a, an Anambra state government, how many doctors do you have? How many medical labs? How many pharmacists? How many equipment you have, each of the equipment, nobody has it in fingerprint. There's no statistics that can tell you this. We don't have, nobody tell you how many physicists, how many biomedical engineers. There is no clearing house in Nigeria and different states of Nigeria. 
So, and if you are in information darkness, you cannot plan. Because you need information to plan. Power, social amenity, power, building. They gave, Nayut Newi was giving uh, what we call Vamer project, giving CT scan, MRI, modern equipment in 2011. It could not be installed for almost three years because there is no building to put it. They had to go through National Assembly to approve the building before it was built, before it was stored. By the time it was stored, the warranty period has already expired. So infrastructure, we lack infrastructure, power, building, road, water, water, town planning. For you to make technology, there need to be a good time planning. Medicine need time planning. Ambulance, you go to people's house and bring people to the hospital. We say that man is sick. The ambulance go there and bring. When the town is not planned and we don't know where the person is, we don't know the address, it's not easy to do rescue operation. So we need adequate time. We need improved time planning for good technological development. We need we need inter we need correlation with engineers. Medicine is developing on its own. Engineer is facing another direction. We need to collaborate so that equipments can be produced for Nigeria. Engineers have very high, have very high impact in the equipment development in Nigeria. We have very weak research potentials on technology. We need to form consensus at national and state level of what we want and direction. So, if you tell us, I will tell you that Nigeria infrastructure, manpower, is leading to very low practice of high-tech medicine in Nigeria. And how do we improve on it? We say there should be order, peaceful election and orderly transfer of political power. Because without peace, you cannot do anything. Education emphasizing technical education. Adequate study power. International collaboration. And Nigeria should do everything possible to prevent brain drain. We have talked about how the number is so small. Then this small number is still being drained away, unquote. So I don't know where we are going. Mr. VC, sir, my research interest is generating statistics on planning for radiation medicine. I want to build social network with other people towards creating high-tech medicine in Nigeria. Thank you very much, sir. May I remember some people, acknowledge some people, Professor Febu, who was my mentor in university, Professor Gioji Awosaya, and a host of other radiologists. I remember Professor Mbo, who has been a type of mentor to me. I thank Professor Pala, who refused to go abroad, even when he worked in a very harsh environment in our hospital. Mr. Vice Chancellor, I thank you for creating a very wonderful environment in our, in our university for research and training. Other people, Professor Mbono, Ikeze, and host of others, thank you for making the university and teaching hospital very conducive for us when we came there. I thank my mentors in Switzerland, Professor Thomas Samata, Academy of Institute of Diagnostic Radiology. I cannot mention everybody here. I thank my brother and my father, Augustine Ongwamwezeze, and the wife, my sisters, Isaac, Esther, Mbo, Esther Asomba, Medlin Mwabweze, and a host of others. My wife, Ijoma, and children, Chisum, 
Agatha and Chukwebuka. Thank you. My brothers and sisters, colleagues, thank you very much for attending this lecture. Please, another round of applause for him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, that was a wonderful one. Honestly, I never knew that, uh, you know, there were connections between political science and radiology. Honestly, even to the extent of the death of Abacha. We were thinking now about Abacha, but uh, <laughs> you see. So we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, without wasting much of our time, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I humbly invite the chairman of uh, the university inaugural lecture committee, Professor Richard, who are here to come forward to invite the vice chancellor for the decoration of the 91st inaugural lecturer. Mr. Vici, sir, may I have your permission to invite you to the podium to decorate the inaugural lecturer? Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, today, the 21st of September 2023, Thursday, Professor Kenneth Chukwood Eze has successfully delivered the 91st inaugural lecture of Fundamda Zikwe University, Oka. I kindly request you, sir, to honor him and recognize him before this physical and virtual audience and permit his name to be entered into the register of inaugurated professors. This is, sir. Thank you very much. Professor um, Wakuye, you have said it all. Uh, you have been a professor for some time now, Professor Eze. But they have not yet been inaugurated into the leagues of professors. So today is the day you officially been initiated. If you answer prof now, you can uh, boldly beat your hand on your chest and say, uh, both God and man have testified. So I want to congratulate you and congratulate your beautiful wife who has stood by you. And it's my pleasure, therefore, and a singular honor on behalf of our Senate to uh, decorate the 91st inaugural lecturer of our great university in the person of Professor Kenneth Chukudieze. And I so decorate you. Congratulations. We say big congratulations to him. They will now take some shots. Other shots will be taken outside the auditorium. We say a very big congratulations to you. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Mr. DJ. Thank you, thank you. We are concluding. And may I inform all of us that we have to stay put until the recession is over after the closing prayer. May I invite a member of the uh, UNISIC uh, committee that organized this very important academic program, a member of the inaugural lecture committee, Professor Mkiru Melodo, former dean, faculty of agriculture, to please come forward for the vote of thanks. Adair Vice Chancellor, the Digital Vice Chancellor, who is on Information Superhighway. <laughs> Permit me to respectfully observe the protocols. And so I want to appreciate you for making our time to come for this inaugural lecture and staying till the end. It's in a bid to project the university. We are moving and very soon we will get to 200 before you leave. Thank you very much. I want to also appreciate everyone here, the professors, directors, Beans, the council members here for making our time to come for this inaugural lecture. Thank you. We appreciate you. In the same way, I also want to appreciate the inaugural lecture committee with the able leader, Professor. Richard Wakwe, thank you very much for leading us rightly. The inaugural lecturer of the day, I guess radiology had something to do with agriculture too. For us to have sustainable food security, you have to be on the field with us so that we don't inhale so much. Thank you very much for educating us today. We have learned a lot. With your dear wife, Madam, we appreciate you for standing beside and working with him. We appreciate you greatly. And the university orator for doing what you know how to do best and doing it in the best way. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's event in this university of the moment. And so at this moment, I want to say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mkiru Melodo, immediate past dean, faculty of agriculture. We thank you 
for giving the vote of thanks. Please may I invite Venerable Professor Christian Nuzata to please come up for the for the closing prayer, please. Immediately after the prayer, the recession will proceed. We move outside the auditorium before all of us will leave the auditorium. Thank you very much. Shall we pray? In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. Eternal King of glory, we thank you. The Lord God Almighty, who doeth all things beautiful, we thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the grace, the strength, the enablement you give to our brother. Thank you because we know that his presentation had impacted positively on all of us. Thank you for all the people that came from different places. We know righteous Jehovah that you will take them back safely. We pray everlasting Lord God Almighty that you take us all back to our various destinations safely in the name of Jesus. We pray everlasting Jehovah Lord God Almighty that by reason of today's meeting, your name and your name alone will be glorified. Let nothing we have had today, nothing we have said, nothing we have done, stand against us in judgment. Pride will not enter into the heart of any man here. But all honor and glory will be attributed to you. As we go, Father, we ask you go with us. We commit our dear Vice Chancellor before your glorious presence. We ask everlasting Jehovah Lord God Almighty that you continue to uphold him, continue to protect him, continue to preserve him. Father, may he be kept and preserved faultless till the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray everlasting Jehovah Lord God Almighty that greater insight than you have given him in times past, you will yet give him in Jesus' name. He will lead this university to that height that will cause every man in this university to be proud. Jehovah Lord God Almighty, we give you praise. Thank you for everything. Blessed be your holy name. For we pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we share the grace and fellowship? The love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now. Yeah, the Lord be with you. Amen. Thank you. Yun is Fountain of knowledge and of wisdom, source of our hope and confidence. It's where freedom through education we gain. It's where friends and Thank you very much. The recession now will commence led by the Vice Chancellor. Thank you, the Chairman, and then the Nobel Lecturer and his wife. Thank you.
Santo Con profesos Hasta profesos asocio profesos Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 